Have you heard of Saint Francis de Sales? No. All right. Today I'm going to tell you the story of this amazing saint who is considered the patron saint for writers and the deaf. Let's start then. Yes. Saint Francis de Sales was born to a noble family at Chateau de Sales in the Kingdom of Savoy near Geneva, Switzerland, on August twenty-first, fifteen sixty-seven. Francis was both intelligent and gentle as a boy. He had a desire to serve God from a very young age. Francis's father was a senator from the province of Savoy in France. His father wanted Francis to become a lawyer and politician when he grew up. Hey, Francis. Yes, Papa. Why are you spending so much time in your prayers? You can do so many things with that time. I, I. It's just that I like praying. Ha <laughs> ha, praying, huh? You know I want you to become a politician when you grow up, right? I know, Papa. I will become a politician like you. Hmm, that's very good. Now finish your dinner. Although Francis wanted to become a priest, he kept his wish from his parents. His mother taught him catechism, narrating beautiful stories with examples. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We call this Trinity. When Francis was playing in the fields with friends, he repeated the teachings and stories his mother told him. Little did he know that he was being trained for his precious future work. That was to teach catechism with beautiful examples. His father feared that Francis might get pampered and spoiled by his mother's love, so he hired a very rigid and demanding priest named Father Deeg to tutor him. Father Deeg was a man known to be demanding and perfectionist in everything. He helped Francis in his formation, but he also made him go through a very difficult time. But young Francis never complained. At the age of 14, Francis went to study at the University of Paris. Francis soon excelled in philosophy and theology. It was during this time that his heart got more and more fixed with the desire to serve God. He took a vow of perpetual chastity, placing himself under the protection of the Blessed Virgin. He was not free from trials either. The love of God had always meant more than anything else to him, but for the last few days, Francis felt that he had lost God's favor. This obsession haunted him day and night. It was what we call depression these days. O、oh、Lord, if by your infinite justice. I have to go to hell forever. Grant me the grace to love you there. After the prayer, like a miracle, all the thoughts, sadness, and desperation ceased. Never was he tempted like this again. In order to please his father, Francis was taking lessons on fencing and riding as well. Ride slowly. Yes, that's right. Ah, ah, ah. There you go again. Are you all right? Yes, coach. Huh? God was trying to make His will clear that day. Francis had fallen thrice that day, and each time he fell, his sword came out of the scabbard. And every time it came out, the sword and the scabbard came to rest on the ground in the shape of a Christian cross. That's. It's the third time today. God, is this some kind of a message? Francis completed his studies and returned home. It's so good to see you, my son. Good to see you too, Papa. I'm so proud of you. Thanks, Papa. Hmm. 
Now that you have finished your studies, it's time for you to get married. Huh? Don't look so surprised, son. I have chosen a girl for you from one of the best families here. But, but, huh? What is it? I, I don't want to marry. I want to become a priest. What? A priest? Yes, Papa. I have already decided on this. I've always wanted to become a priest. This is ridiculous. After much discussion and agreement with his father, Francis was ordained to the priesthood by the Bishop of Geneva in 1593. It was during these times that the Christians living in the village of Chablais were getting attacked by enemies. The bishop had sent a missionary to help the Christians, but the mission failed and he had to return back. I'm sorry, Your Holiness, but the priest we had sent to Chablais has returned. What happened? It seems that there are only 20 Christian families left in Chablais. They are too scared to express their faith fearing the attacks. Hmm, what do we do now? Shall we send another missionary? But no one would be willing to go there. It is quite a dangerous mission. Hmm, God will show us a way. Pass the message among the chapter and find out if anyone is willing to take up this mission. Yes, Your Holiness. Francis heard about the mission, and he understood the seriousness of it. He went to the bishop seeking his permission to go to Chablais. Francis, this is a very serious mission. Yes, Your Holiness, I do understand it. Do you realize that you can even get killed during this mission? Yes, sir, I understand. And you're still willing to go? I am prompt to obey the commands of my Lord, and he commanded me to do this. The bishop agreed, and it was decided that Francis would leave for Chablais the following week. But his father did not agree with him. According to him, the mission was equal to sending his son to death. My son, you could die. You don't even realize what you're doing. I do realize, Papa. I don't want to get in the way of God's will, but I would never want to see my son dead. I will never give my permission for this mission. But Papa... Francis went ahead with the mission without his father's approval. On September 14th, the day of the Feast of the Holy Cross, he left for reclaiming Chablais along with his cousin. Are you afraid, Louis? No, I'm not. As long as you are there with me. <laughs> That's very good. How long do we have to ride? Hmm. We should reach here by tomorrow morning. Do you think this mission is as dangerous as everyone say it is? Hmm. I'm not sure. But all I'm concerned is the welfare of Christians living there now. I can understand how difficult it can be when you're not allowed to follow your religion. I'm sure God will show us a way. Look, that's the castle of Allinges. That's where we are going to stay. Hmm, but why are the soldiers here? Hello, brother. You must be the governor. Yes, you are right. Governor, why are these soldiers standing outside the castle? It's for your own protection. You must be knowing that Christians in this area are attacked by some people. Hmm, I know. Don't worry. They will never meddle with your affairs. It's just a precaution that we are taking. All right. Thank you, brother. The next day, Francis set out to meet the Christian families in Chablais. 
This must be the house. Yes, it should be. Let's go and see if anyone is around. Hello, is anybody home? Huh, who are you? Good morning, sir. My name is Father Francis. What do you want? I came to tell you that I will be preaching tomorrow at the local church. You can participate if you wish so. What? Do you think I want to get killed? Go away and don't come back. That was quick. Hmm. Come on. Let's go to the next house. One by one, Francis met all 20 Christian families and called them to the church. The next day, Francis started to preach at the local church. Only one family attended this, as everyone else were afraid of being seen inside the church. The journey through the valley posed many difficulties for Francis, especially during winter. One cold winter night, Francis was on his way to the castle. Huh? Did I hear something? Is anybody here? Huh? Wolves? Ugh. Francis ran toward a tree nearby and climbed on top of it. He stayed there throughout the night to stay away from the wolves. The next day, some farmers found him on top of the tree. Hey, look! What is it? Isn't that a priest on top of that tree? Yes. He looked like a priest. Come, let's go and see. Hey, you! Huh? What are you doing up there? Did you stay there all night? Some wolves tried to attack me yesterday night. Can you please help me come down? We are coming! Wait there, sir! Francis had stayed on top of the tree all through the cold night and he was very weak. If the good farmers had not found him, then he would have died that day. The farmers quickly grew fond of Francis and they visited him regularly. Slowly they started coming to the church and after a few days they got converted to Christianity. On another occasion, Francis was attacked by robbers. It was only because of a miracle that he survived the attack. But nothing could stop Francis. He continued to preach in different towns to different people. Sometimes he was stoned. Sometimes he was beaten. In the bitter winters, his feet froze badly. They bled while he tramped through the snow. Months passed, and slowly everyone started seeing the fruits of his missionary works. On the other hand, his father kept sending him letters asking him to abandon the mission. Francis always responded by saying that he will continue his work until the bishop orders him to return. It was during one such night that Francis got an idea. He started to write a series of pamphlets using the church doctrine. Great indeed was the gift which the Eternal Father gave to the world when he bestowed upon his only Son. How then has he not given us every other gift with him? You remember well, I am sure, the beautiful history of the Holy Patriarch Joseph which has already been so often told but which can never be too considered. Being Viceroy of Egypt, his brothers who lived in Mesopotamia came to him for the supplies. The unusual patience of Francis kept him working. No one would listen to him and no one would open the door. Francis now found a way to get his message to them. He started slipping the pamphlets he wrote under the doors. 
When the parents refused to listen to him, Francis started preaching to the kids. When they saw how kind he was being to the kids, the parents started talking to him as well. Slowly and steadily, he gathered more and more disciples. By the time Francis returned home, it is believed that some 40,000 people had joined the church. Francis had successfully restored the Christian faith in the province, and he was rightly called as the Apostle of Chablais. <laughs> This is extraordinary. Ha 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 ha. You're being too, King Bishop. It's true. You have a gift, brother. You should use it wisely. Yes, I'm trying my best. Listen, I have told you this many times before. I want you to be my successor after I die. Please, will you at least consider it? I'm grateful for your offer, Your Holiness, but I'm sorry, I cannot accept it. Francis refused the offer and did not accept it at first. But finally he agreed to his wish, considering that this could be the will of God. In 1602, Bishop Grenier died and Francis was consecrated as the Bishop of Geneva. In 1604, Francis took one of the most important steps in his life the step towards extraordinary holiness and mystical union with God. He was preaching at Dijon one day, and that's when he saw a widow closely listening to his sermon. The widow's name was Jane de Chantal, and she was a dedicated Christian. Huh? Didn't I see him in a dream? He is the spiritual director God has sent for me. Jane's husband had recently died in an accident and three of her kids died in infancy. She was living with her father-in-law, who often ill-treated her. Jane wanted Bishop Francis to become her spiritual director, but Francis insisted on waiting. Jane was on a path to mystical union with God, and in directing her, Francis was compelled to follow her and become a mystic himself. After working with Jane for years, in 1610, he founded a new order called the Order of Visitation. Francis was overworked and often ill as he was preaching and instructing without a break. He was often seen catechizing to the deaf people as well. Francis insisted that every Christian was called to holiness and sanctity. He gave spiritual direction to the common man leading their everyday life. His famous book, Introduction to the Devout Life, was written for common people and not just for the clergy. In 1622, the Duke of Saboya invited him to Avignon. The bishop accepted the invitation, risking his poor health on a long journey in the middle of winter. It looked like the saint realized his end was near. Before he left, he had entrusted all of his responsibilities to others in such a way that his organizations would continue running smoothly. On his way back, the saint stopped at Lyon, and he stayed in the house of the gardener at the convent. Even though he was very tired, he continued to attend his visitors. It was then that one of the nuns asked him what virtue she was supposed to practice. Here, read this. Humility. I put all my hope in the Lord, and He heard my plea by bringing me out of this ditch of misery and of the swamp of iniquity. His last word was the name of Jesus. While the people around him kneeled to pray the litanies for the agonizing, St. Francis de Sales expired sweetly on December 28, 1622. He was 56 years old when he died. That was amazing! Yes, he was such a great person! <laughs> That's true, Jim! Uncle, I've heard that Venice tomb was opened after many years 
His body was still found intact. Is it true? Hmm. In 1632, the exhumation of St. Francis de Sales' body was conducted to examine its condition. The tomb was opened by the commissioners of the Holy See, who were accompanied by the nuns of the Visitation Convent. When the tombstone was lifted, the saint appeared the same as when he lived. His lovely face conserved the gentle and mild expression as in his sleep. His hand was taken and the arm was elastic even though he had been buried ten years. From the coffin emerged a pleasant fragrance. Wow! Thanks for telling us the story, Uncle. All right, that's all for today. I will tell you another story tomorrow. Goodbye. Goodbye, Uncle.